I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Suffering is not unique to one particular group. It's universal to all groups. In the sharing of the stories, we will see our common interest not to have another group persecuted or prosecuted unfairly. Who is the leaders that are, I mean, you, you're a leader that's rising up in this, but who's, who's really, whose voice is being heard now? That's so important, James, because let's not look for individual leaders. Uh, let's find leaders right among the everyday people. Right now, our young people, are, they don't want people to talk to them. They want people to listen to them. And I think the best thing I can do and uh, the governor and the mayor can do is really get out the way and allow these young people to be heard. And one of the most dangerous parts are the groups who don't want police reform. They're trying to burn down our city. And we need to acknowledge that they're professionals. Are they professional anarchists? They are not part of the movement that our young people are calling for to change how police is, have been treating people of color throughout history. And and Eric, who who are they then? You know, New York City has these protests, and then the curfew happens, and then this other force kind of flows. And who's paying these people? Like, you know, why are they professionals? Why are are they doing this? Eric Adams, Brooklyn Borough President. Also, as many people probably don't know, you were in the uh, you were in law enforcement. You were a police officer for 22 years, and you were very active not only as a police officer but in reforming police laws and getting rid of any sort of you know corruption or and so on. And, and now you're Brooklyn Borough President. You 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 won the presidency with 91 percent of the vote, and now I'm sure you've been very busy dealing with. Um, What's been happening in the in New York City? And, and, you know, it's been happening all around the country, but in New York City, it's been happening the past week. And what's been going on? I don't even know how to start. How are you doing? <laughs> it's good, good. Always good to speak with you, James. And you're right. Uh, the last few weeks, uh, they have been extremely uh, complex. And it's important to acknowledge the complexity 
uh, because oftentimes we look at things that happen or occur physically without knowing that it also has a balance on what happens to us emotionally and spiritually. And if you don't look at both, uh, you're not going to really solve the problems in front of you. Yeah. So, so, you know, to some extent, I mean, we just are, are 12 weeks into a lockdown from this pandemic and, you know, now this happened with this, you know, the horrible death with George Floyd in um, Minneapolis. And, you know, that led to riots all over the country and in New York City. It's get, it gets how, how to help us understand what's happening here, because it seems like there's there's many groups. There's protesting and then there's this this looting and what's going on? What's happening? And that's important. And you really have to dissect the moment. And uh, I want to say that this is my life's work. When you do an analysis of it, you know, uh, from the discussions we had previously. Right. Uh, you know, I was beat by police as a child uh, severely. And I later became a police officer after civil rights activists in Brooklyn that I respected wanted me to go in and change the police department. Uh, James, there were times when I would uh, wear my civilian clothes and jeans and march with protesters and yell, no justice, no peace. And then at the end of the night, I would go back into the precinct and put on my uniform and go protect those same protesters. I know what it is to have someone spit in your face or throw rocks at you. Uh, I know the complexities of that, but I also knew how important it was to reform policing. And so when you look fast forward, as what has happened across the country, uh, this ocean of change that we're trying to accomplish, there are many rivers that are flowing into it. And some of those rivers, their agenda is not the same as the true uh, righteous fight that our young people are participating in. And one of the most dangerous parts of the flow into this ocean are the groups who don't want police reform. They're trying to burn down our city. And we need to acknowledge that they're professionals. They know how to make uh, devices that can destroy property of uh, fire bombs. They throw Molotov cocktails at police vehicles. Uh, they're destroying stores and properties. Uh, they are not part of the movement that our young people are calling for to change how police is, have been treating people of color throughout history. And and Eric, who who are they then? Like. So, so there's really several questions. One is, how do how do the protests eventually die down? And 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 what what are they? You know, I totally support everything that they're protesting. But then, what happens next? Because I don't think we know. I haven't seen anything like this since 1992, Rodney King in L.A. And before that, before my time, I guess it's 1968 with, you know, when Martin Luther King was was killed and there was riots all around the country with that. And now there's this. And so there's, there's that direction, but then also who are these people who are infiltrating the movement and kind of ruining what's the, the message of this? Cause most of America does kind of put the two together and don't really understand that it's, there's multiple things happening here. That's well said. And as I stated, of, uh, of just breaking it down in a simple fashion, uh, there are three rivers flowing into this ocean. And one of them is what I just described. Uh, they're professional uh, anarchists. Uh, they come from outside the city, the most part. They have infiltrated uh, this city and started recruiting people to help them. As you saw, you saw two attorneys who threw Molotov cocktails at police vehicles. And we should get into that in a moment. But these are professionals. They sent people into the city to scout out the city to see police response. Uh, they have uh, different individuals who are assigned to carry backpacks full of stones and rock to re-up and resupply uh, other people. They are professional at, at making devices that can cause fires. They are professionals and their goal, we need to be clear, their goal is not police reform reform. Their goal is burning down cities and they need to be identified. And part of the conversations I have been having 
uh, with some of the leaders of the righteous call for police reform. I've been assisting them in identifying who these people are, how they dress, what to look for, and what they're, how they go about getting inside the crowd and creating the chaos that can even harm innocent people. Then you have this other group that are extremely uh, angry uh, and they're just looking for crimes of opportunity. Uh, they leave every night and wait for the evening hours and they come out with a hammer and a shopping bag and they hide behind, behind the movement and they're creating, you know, just ways of opportunities. They're criminals of opportunities and we need to make sure that they too are not destroying the movement because we have a the overwhelming number of people who are marching are concerned about addressing police reform. But all you need is one or two agitators that we saw even during the civil rights movement uh, that can destroy this righteous call for police reform. So, so before I get into um, kind of what's what's going on with each of these three groups, like you know, particularly the the professionals who's paying them, and you know. There is this issue that the protesters are protesting the same thing the Rodney King protesters were protesting, are protesting almost the same thing the protesters in 1968 were protesting. And maybe this is too complex an issue for a short podcast, but you've you've seen it all. You've been there as police, government, you, you're, you're involved now. What, why isn't this changing? Why isn't this getting better like why are we still having these these protests and and, and it is getting better uh, you know, I, i'm extremely optimistic uh, we've come a long way from where we were and we have a long way to go to where we are and it's about building it right it's not about being instant and it's important that these young people they're the grandchildren of the civil rights fighters of yesteryears you know we we are not still picking cotton we're not still riding on the back of the bus uh, we don't walk into our parks and see signs that say blacks are not allowed to sit on a bench and water fountains for blacks and whites uh, we're not at that place where we were and so we're continuing the evolution and real substantive change is evolution it's not instant and when I say not instant, it doesn't mean we should sit back and wait. We need to continue to press for it. But let's be clear, we've made a lot of progress. And I think that it will be an insult to the likes of the Rosa Parks, the Dr. Kings, and the others who fought hard to get here to say we've done nothing at all. We've done a lot. And we need to continue to do more. And this generation is now uh, have the baton. It's being passed to them. Uh, the winds of change, uh, they have always been blown by young people. I don't care if it's in Cuba with Fidel Castro, if it's in Soweto, South Africa, if it's in the civil rights movement of yesteryears. Uh, young people always have blown the winds of change. And this generation is now adding uh, their uh, oxygen to blowing the winds in the right direction. And it's more than just police abuse. We need to be clear on that, what you're seeing right now. Uh, the officer having his knee on the neck of Floyd is also part of the anger of the issues around how the coronavirus response was in communities of color, high unemployment, uh, oversaturation of drugs and guns in communities. You're seeing the energy of people coming together and say they want to live with dignity and respect. And if we just change one aspect of it and not all the other aspects of it, uh, then uh, we're not solving the problem. And so we've, we've made changes and we have a lot of changes to go. And these young people are the right, uh, they have the right energy and spirit that's needed. I, I agree with you that it's not just it's not just one issue. It's all, I, I almost hate to overuse the phrase, but it's systemic because it's not just, it's not just reform uh, of the police. It's criminal justice reform. It's economic reform. It's why aren't more opportunities available in different communities. And this is something that's hard to encapsulate in a single round of protests. But, you know, as Martin Luther King has said, you know, your people protest because they want to be heard and are do you think these protests are, are working do you think we're hearing do you think people are hearing yes i do I, i'm extremely excited uh when i see uh, progressive 
smart thinking people of various ethnicities are now rallying around a uniform uh, identity of stopping uh, police abuse. Uh, that uh, beginning starts a real conversation on other areas. It breaks down those walls. Uh, we broke down physical walls, but let's be honest, James, there were so many, there were so many symbolic walls. Uh, we started living inside our homes using Twitter and Facebook and Instagram as a method of interacting with each other. You know, people talk about the meanness of, of the current occupant of the White House, but let's not kid ourselves. Uh, America has become a mean place. Uh, we sent out nasty comments about each other, bullying, and some of the people who are on social media, uh, either you believe with them or take their positions or they barrage you and become trolls and call you all sorts of names. And we've seen the ugliness of America that goes far beyond the behavior of Donald Trump. America has become an ugly place and we hide behind behind social media to carry out our ugly deeds. And this is forcing us, now you have to get outside and show your face, walk the streets with each other and understand that under the banner of what happened to George Floyd, we're now united. And now while we're out here, let's talk about that gentrification. While we're out here, let's talk about every year black and brown students are never educated to be ready for the future in their lives. Let's talk about the lack of health care. So now while we're walking next to each other, let's engage some real conversations. And this way, we're no longer just hitting inside our homes and we don't know who we are. I, I, I agree. And so so then there's these other groups that come in, the the, the angry groups who, who have, you know, they... And I don't, I actually don't really, I don't blame anybody. You're right. We've had these, you know, 80 days, whatever of lockdown, people are got unemployed. They're, they're in, in various degrees of economic distress and there's a lot of anger and, and just simmering underneath society. What happens, what happens next? How do the protesters kind of say, okay, we, we accomplished the mission. Now we're going to move to the next stage of this, which is discussion and hopefully change. Uh, we 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 have to do something that's really interesting, and I say I say this all the time. One of the greatest gifts we were given is the ability to communicate something that we rarely we rarely carry out. I am amazed how people don't communicate, uh, and communication is not that you wait for me to finish the sentence so I can tell you how wrong you are. No, we need to te teach deep deep listening. Uh, we need to actually allow people to share uh, their perspective and learn from it. Uh, I call myself that caterpillar that crawled around on the ground and looked up at a butterfly and said, you'll never get me in one of those, only to know I'm going to go through my own evolution one day. I am not the man that I was uh, 20, 30 years ago. And many people say, no, no one is. But in fact, we do carry on those same uh individual juvenile actions and behavior, but our toys change. One of the best things we could do now is set up uh, groups of people communicating, talking. We're doing a project that's called Breaking Bread, Building Bonds, where we're having 100 dinners over our city. 10 people at each dinner, all coming from different ethnic groups and different backgrounds, so they can start talking to each other. We don't talk to each other in America and particularly in New York. We act, we, we are one of the most diverse uh, places you can live, but in fact, we live in our silos. We go to our same bars, we go to our same restaurants, we sit among our same groups and have our same conversation without any real growth. And now it's time to grow and go beyond our comfort zone and enjoy the beauty of healthy discomfort. Yeah, and so that's a great idea, these dinners, and then, and and just any sort of discussion. But again, like how do these, across the country, what do you think happens next with these protests, particularly since it's so, many people don't understand that there's multiple groups involved here and that it's somewhat insidious on the the rioting side. Uh, how does the, how does the, how do the protesters make sure their mission gets accomplished and how do you see this kind of going to its next phase uh, it's, it, and that's a great question i think there's a couple of things uh number one we have a great deal of organizations and nonprofits uh, that focus on conflict resolutions throughout the entire country 
it's now ta- time for them to be to get the necessary funding to hold uh, small gatherings on the local levels. National governments in the international arena, they do not have the solutions. It is now time for cities and local governments to fix the problems that they're seeing on the level where they are. Uh, This is a place for cities now to make the right decisions. And cities have communities and communities have neighborhoods and neighborhoods have blocks. We have to actually go down to that level. And I am calling on the nonprofits to start hosting small gatherings like Breaking Bread, Building Bond, or any other type, and engage people in human-to-human conversations. But will they? Like, you're, you're calling on them to do this, but will they do it? Is it, do you think this starts to actually engage the protesters in conversation? Like, like, like do you think this will happen? Yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, and when I've, I have been speaking to some of the representatives of Black Lives Matter, the Brooklyn chapter, and sharing with them, while we march, instruct people who are marching to exchange information with five people who are there with them. That's a great idea. And do a follow-up march or follow-up gathering with those five people via Zoom, via WebEx or Squadcast or whatever, where they are going to take upon a project where they're going to do something for someone other than themselves. Give people the mission and be intentional about the instructions. Have people create something that I call my 100 point list that I start at the beginning of the day. I don't go to sleep until I get 100 points. Three points may be uh, just calling someone I don't know and wishing them a good day. Two points may be just saying good morning. Another five points may be buying lunch for someone. At the end of the night, if I don't have 100 points, I have to put the dollar amount inside a jar that I give away at the end of the week. It's about being intentional. And using this gathering of thousands of people and say, now you're going to go and communicate with five people each day that you march that you didn't know before. And you are going to create an assignment of helping someone that you didn't help before. That is being intentional. That's being tactical and actually document each one of those areas that you have assisted and made people better off than where they were. And you will start to see the results. And do you think that will start that type of cooperation will start to happen in New York City and then other cities? Like, do you see this kind of nationally sort of coming to some resolution? Uh, well, let's 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 look at and learn um, from uh, coronavirus. Coronavirus started with a sneeze. It f- spread out over and over again. Once it hit our shores, it started moving to different people. It started growing in families, and then it spread it out to the places that the families went to visit. Uh, If a virus can move that far and that fast and be intentional about its action, then surely mankind, with our mental capacity, we can also become as contagious as a virus. So that's that's a good analogy, and I I like it because it's a source of, of optimism here. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. 
So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. The analogy I get nervous about is if you look at like 1992 or even 1968, there were very strong voices of leadership that, that rose up, you know, Rodney King in 1992 himself rose up and said, can't we all get along? Robert F. Kennedy in 1968, you know, he said, you know, I too have had a family member killed by 
a white man and that somehow him rise you know rioting was happening all over the place and somehow him saying that stirred everybody's emotions and brought it to some somewhat of a resolution but i don't know who is the leaders that are i mean you you're a leader that's rising up in this but who's who's really whose voice is being heard now that's so important james because let's not look for individual leaders uh, let's find leaders right among the everyday people. And there's something that we have that they didn't have. The reason the numbers are so high in many of these protests that you see across our nation is because of this thing called social media. People are now able to mo mobilize and like minds are able to come together uh, better than ever. Now we could use the tool of social media for good or we could use it to be harmful. And so we are able now to reach more people and everyday people are now able to create a message and a communication of like minds. Uh, I, I'm a believer, let like minds come together. If your uh, belief is that you wanna do things for our senior population, uh, connect with other people who have that same desire. If it's your belief to do things around education, connect with those who have that same belief around education. So this is a great opportunity to build these cluster areas of like minds as we start to deal with the awesome amount of problems we're facing as a city as and as a nation. So, you know, I always, as soon as this happened and these protests started happening, I, I did think of you and your story when you were younger, you had an encounter with a police officer, you and your brother both, and you were, you were hurt and you used that to sort of uh, become, a, you became interested in law enforcement, you became a police officer, you, you became really focused on reform and that led into your career in politics. I, I feel like if you, and I, maybe you've probably already done this, but you go to these protests and tell this story, people are going to, to hear and listen to you and, and it'll really, resonate with people and, and my story resonates and there's so many stories like uh, like mine and I, I believe that uh, we all ha we all have a unique story and it's about sharing those stories because sometimes uh, we look at individuals and believe that uh, their lives have been uh, basically a crystal stare uh, and in reality it hasn't it has it's difficult moments and it's the sharing of those stories when I do of uh, the breaking bread, building bonds, and have dinners, and I sit down and listen uh, to uh, what people have come through. I'm amazed, and it just gives me a different outlook. And it's so nourishing uh, to not only my physical being, but the anatomy of my spirit. And I, I think sometimes we lose the fact that everything we are physically, we also are spiritually, and there's a connection of how we need to nourish ourselves physically and spiritually. And the stories I've had, I have heard uh, from people and the things that they have overcome, is just really inspire me of how amazing we are as human beings. And I think those stories need to be told more. We need to look at that Hasidic man and understand what he has come through. We need to look at the person who wears the turban and sheep and, um, and, and from the Sikh community and understand his journey of having a symbol of of who he is and how he's, he was treated after September 11. Or the African-American or the Caribbean-American or Chinese-American. Who You know, when you think about the Chinese-Americans when they built the railroad system, uh, the continental railroad system and couldn't even ride on the trains and were demonized. Uh, we all have these stories. Suffering is not unique to one particular group. Uh, it's, it's universal to all groups in the sharing of those stories. We will see our common bond and our common interest not to have another group persecuted or prosecuted unfairly. And then, and so now, you know, it seems like, you know, New York City has these protests and then the curfew happens. And then as you were saying, you know, this other river or this other force kind of flows into the, the river. What, who's paying these people? Like, you know, why are they professionals? Why are, are they doing this and trying to ruin this message? Uh, it's a combination based on the intelligence that I've received uh, from the briefings and based on just my uh, overview of some of the videos that, that you witnessed. If you look closely at some of the YouTube videos and some of the 
uh, Instagram or Facebook videos, any trained law enforcement officer can, can see uh, the action of an agitator. And as I look through them and while I'm on the ground, I'm at all the protests just about uh, to one, two in the morning. I notice the individuals who are carrying the backpacks, who are taking rocks out of their backpack, backpacks, who are basically agitators and they're professional at what they're doing, having cars located near the site, able to get in the, in the, into the cars and get away quick. They're just there for a mission only. And so it's not so much that they're being paid with cash. People have different philosophies. You have people from the far right that with nothing they would like to enjoy uh, the extremists, um, not just political right, but just extremist views. Uh, you have white supremacist organizations, nothing they would like to see more to see uh, people of color and police clash against each other. Uh, mm -hmm. You have people who just believe our government needs to burn down. I know it's hard for many of us to believe, but there are individuals who are extremely dangerous uh, to uh, our, our country. And I don't want to see my government burned down. I don't want to see my cities burned down. I want us to reform and make this a fair place for everyone. But you don't do it in the midst of flames. And 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 is there a way, like you say, you've you've seen it? Like, are police able to arrest them, or do we know? Are they coordinated in any way? Like, how do we stop these people? Something. And, and, and that's that, that question, James, when you're dealing with a thousand people and people hide within the march and carry out some actions of throwing a bottle or throwing a rock or doing something that is only going to aggravate the crowd and the police, uh, it is difficult just to isolate and contain them. Uh, that is one of the challenges that you have when you're dealing with large volumes like this. That's why it's imperative uh, for the conversation and relationship I have with some of the organizers for, to educate them so they can police themselves. They can have their own marshals, own people on the ground who can walk through and identify those who are trying to agitate the situation and remove them. And that started to happen. As you see in some of the marches across the country is becoming more peaceful is because the organizers have now become aware that there's a body who has attempted to infiltrate their movement and hijack the movement. And you're going to see more and more of the organizers become aware of these body of people. Do you think some of them will get arrested? Do you think there's going to be, we'll find out more about them? Well, some have been arrested, believe it or not. Uh, when you look at in New York City, one out of every seven people arrested and a large number of people who were arrested, uh, many of them came from outside the city. Uh, when you look at the young lady who threw the Molotov, Molotov cocktail at the police vehicle, she was not from New York, she was from outside the city. Uh, but we're gonna start drilling down on individuals who are carrying out these extremely dangerous encounters. And we're going to see that many of them are from outside the city. A car was found in the Crown Heights area where they had several bottles of uh, set up to be filled with gasoline and a tank full of gas in the trunk that wanted to be that was going to be used. And so there are people who are extremely dangerous and they're well organized and their goal is really to hurt our city. And we need to be uh, steadfast in removing them from uh, this very righteous pursuit for justice. So, so like the woman with the Molotov cocktail, were we, were you able to interrogate her or find out what she was doing? And, you know, I see on Twitter, a lot of these people kind of coordinating things and organizing and, and so on. And it, it seems disturbing. Yeah, so true. And it should be disturbing to all of us uh, because a, a, a explosive device, a serious fire, uh, that can harm our children and families. My son marches uh, in the, he has been marching in the marches that we've wit witnessed in the protest. Uh, he spent some time with me together. We marched uh, the other night to about two in the morning. And imagine if a, if a person who has, who has bad intention shoots at a police during the march and the police return fire, you are jeopardizing the lives of everyone who is there. And this is a very serious issue that I'm concerned about. And we want to do everything that we could possibly do to allow people there a right to protest, but you know, also their right to be protected. And, and so when, when you have arrested these people, were you able to get any information from them or any sense that, you know, they could stop or how to, how to stop them? 
Uh, that is that is over my food chain. If you haven't noticed, I no longer wear a blue uniform. <laughs> I'm wearing a blue shirt, so I figured, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, so, but I'm sure uh, there's information uh, to be received. And I, and I want to, as we talked about that, I want to switch gears briefly and talk about uh, the two individuals here. They were two attorneys that carried out a Molotov cocktail attempt to take the life of, of four officers. They were two attorneys that were furloughed because of COVID-19. So think about the significance of that. We have two people who uh, are very educated, highly trained, uh, sworn to carry out the, uh, the and protect the law and our constitution. And now they find themselves of uh, throwing a Molotov cocktail at police while they're in the car trying to kill a uh, police. Two of those police were personal friends of mine. Uh, so what bring people to that level? That's what we have to think about. I haven't seen this since uh, the 60s when you saw very intelligent people carry out terrible deeds. And just as we have terrorist operations that have sleeper cells and recruit people when they at a bad time, uh, we need to be aware that you have those that are attempting to recruit people at this difficult time. High level of layoffs, number of people don't know how they're going to pay their rent, number of people uh, don't have housing, uh, health care. These issues breed the opportunities for people to turn and do harmful things. Even reasonable, logical people can be pushed over the edge, and we need to make sure that edge is not there for them to be pushed over. And, and, you know, you know me, I'm an optimistic person in general, but this latest situation and the fact that it was, you know, you know, there's so much economic harm was caused in these lockdowns. And admittedly it was, it's a complicated decision because of the, you know, pandemic and so on. But I am nervous that there's kind of this, this inertia that just keeps this going and the the right the, the the people like you're saying with the Molotov cocktails they're feeding off of the the legitimate concerns of the protesters that the protesters are the the fuel but then these guys are the the fire and you have to snuff out the fire somehow no so true so true and we do that by this universe that I have been in as a person who fought against police abuse and then became a police officer has given me a real opportunity uh, from the relationships. A lot of these young people who are doing the marches, uh, their dads and moms were friends of mine during the movement. I, I marched with Reverend Herbert Daughtry. Uh, I marched with uh, Al Shopton. His children run a youth organization. Reverend Herbert Daughtry's daughter is now part of a large mo uh, youth movement. Uh, so many of these uh, young people, Anthony Beckford, who is the leader of Black Lives Matter in Brooklyn, these are people I've talked to every day about how we could dismantle police abuse. And that gives me an opportunity to give them some real information so they can make their own decisions but they know that I come from a place of trust, caring, and compassion, and it allows me to have these real conversations with them. And so, you know, I was talking to my one of my daughters earlier, Lily, who, who you know, and she wants to go to one of the protests this evening. And I don't really know what to tell her because I am afraid of this other group, which is, which is violent. And I'm also afraid of, you know, the, the more protesters are, the more places there are for these people to hide and infiltrate. And I, I don't really know how to think about this. Well, your fear is real, real, and you should be concerned. And I would be disingenuous if I were to tell you not to be concerned. You should be, uh, because there, there's a real concern. And there's other ways we can find and people can voice their support. Uh, they can voice their support by doing a, a Zoom chat, a WebEx chat. Chat. They can do the protest uh, during the day. You often find uh, that people who are going to do harmful things, if you, as you have noticed, they've often been in the late evening hours. Uh, so if she wants to go out, there was a protest today at Foley Square that went over to Washington Square Park. Uh, that is what you would like her to participate in, in a protest of that nature. And nothing stops her 
from assembling a group of her friends. They could have their own protest. I saw one of the most beautiful displays of support the other day in Crown Heights where a Hasidic woman had eight of her children standing in front of the precinct with a sign that I stand with black lives, they matter. That was so powerful for me. And that that is a protest in itself. A protest doesn't all, always have to be a large gathering. It is just showing in your own way how you stand with something that's important. Uh, people can uh, send out their tweets of that they stand with, some, with, with this cause and this fight. And so she can participate. She doesn't have to be on the sideline and watching this, this very significant moment in her history. Because this is her time. This is, this is the moment of young people to participate. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And um, what what do you think in terms of the leadership of the city, the state, the country? What can anyone say that will, you know, seem like it'll move things forward? That's a great question, question James, uh, because right now our young people are not they don't want people to talk to them. They want people to listen to them. And I think the best thing I can do and uh, the governor and the mayor can do is really get out the way and allow these young people to be heard. Uh, it's unfortunate that on a national level that we have a person who's just mean spirited. And, and I believe he's enjoying every moment of watching our city and countries uh, become divided. But we're better than him. And if we just allow of uh, the beauty, beauty of innocent commitment that comes from young people, uh, I think we can get through this. If, we've all been young before, and we know what it is to be uh, ide idealistic, and it's the combination of idealism and realism that we can come to a good place. And I think they're looking at their future and they're not seeing a real promise. They're watching the environment become destructive. Uh, they're watching the slaughter of animals in a, a very uh, dangerous way. They're watching uh, crime and uh, gun violence uh, that is taking lives and, and they're benchmarking their, their lives by the number of school shootings. Uh, so they're concerned and we need to uh, realize that we screwed this up as adults. It's time for them uh, to allow them to do their thing and come up with their advice and see how we can fix uh, what we created because this is their planet. Well, uh, Eric, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, I know you—you you know you're obviously super busy. I'm really grateful that you <laughs> are spending the time, and and I don't want to. Oh, oh, uh, Lily, my daughter texted me one question. Um, what? Oh, oh, she has. Okay, why is there so much brutality against even the or what, how she puts it? Why is there so much brutality against even the peaceful protests? She's you know, I guess you see in videos that are posted on YouTube, there's a lot of brutality of just the regular protests. And and, and that's a good question that she's asking. And, and this is a conversation I have been embracing and sharing with police officials because we have to fix the problem. Uh, uh, James, everyone in a career is not meant to do every job within the career. There's a reason we have surgeons and we have emergency room doctors. There's a reason we have teachers who, who could teach children with disabilities in comparison to who can teach high school students. Just because you're an educator doesn't mean you can do every aspect of education and the same with medicine and other professions. We don't do that in law enforcement. Every police officer is not made for every assignment within policing. When I was a platoon commander and I had to go through a door to get someone that had a gun, there was a type of cop I wanted with me. He was not the same type of cop I wanted when I had to talk down a hostage or talk down someone that was about to commit suicide. We should have the basic principles of not hurting innocent people, but a lot of people don't have the mental stability to be on the front line and have someone spit in their face or throw a rock at them or make them feel as though they're less than a person. Those are the special people with the special characteristics. Right now, when we send police to assignments, we don't look at those special characteristics. We think because you have on a blue uniform, you could do everything within the policing, and that is not true. Police officers who go across the line and brutalize someone, they should be removed from the department, and if they committed a criminal act, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. 
But in many cases, we just have a poor and bad match with those who are on the front line and those who are interacting with crowds. I knew that every time I went to a pro protest as a cop, I told my, my team, we have to be each other's big brother and our, we have to be our brother's keeper. Don't allow us to go over the edge. Understand that people are angry, they're protesting. It's not personal. It's about just people want their voices heard. We're not doing that enough. You think we will though? You think it'll start to get better in the coming days? Yes, yes I do. Uh, I am extremely optimistic and I tell people all the time, James, uh, I remember on 9-11 in 2001, when our center of trade was attacked and we saw those buildings collapse. And that night, going down there and watching the smoldering ground and people covered in soot, and we just felt as though we weren't going to make it. And I said, I don't know what's going to happen to our country. And then on 9-12, something happened that I always remember. Teachers got up and they taught. Stores opened and retail sold. retailers sold their goods, builders built. And we were ground zero in the epicenter of terrorism, but the country watched us and got their second win. And we're there again, the protests, the coronavirus, all of those things yeah. that we believe is gonna knock the win out of us. Uh, but we are, as the person said on the Apple bottle, we're made up of the best stuff on earth. We're New Yorkers. Well, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, thanks once again. You're running for mayor in 2021. And in 2024, I'm going to vote for you for president. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, sir. And I know you've been out in front of this, you know, ever since this started, which is why I'm so glad you, you came on the podcast. Good luck. And, and you know, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. This, thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Are you ready to take control of your future and be your own boss? At Neighborly, we'll help you go into business for yourself, but not by yourself. As a Neighborly franchise owner, you'll join a community with thousands of passionate and experienced entrepreneurs. With 19 franchise brands providing a variety of home service needs, you'll benefit from decades of established systems and support. Learn more about Neighborly franchising by downloading your free guide at go.nbly.com podcast.